Wonderful. Thank you so much, the Weedman family. Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to John chapter 3 as our young people are dismissed to Children's Church this morning. All right. All the boys and girls off to Children's Church. <clears throat> and we're turning to the Gospel of John chapter 3. <clears throat> well, the seniors had a great uh, trip on uh, Friday. It was Friday, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, we had a great time. The weather was beautiful. We had a wonderful fellowship together. And of course, we had some younger ones in there. Of course, we have very young seniors in it. You know, if you're 50 years old, you're a senior in our church. But we had some younger than that. And uh, we put it on Facebook and said, somebody said, where's all the seniors? These are all young people, you know. And, uh, but anyway, we had a great time. I appreciate those who came, were able to come along. All right, John chapter 3, please. We're going to look at verse 14 and 15 this morning. And if you're able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 14 and verse number 15. You'll notice if you have a red letter Bible that these are the words of Jesus as he was speaking to Nicodemus. In verse 14, Jesus said to Nicodemus, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Father, thank you for your precious word today and the promises of it. Lord, it is the only thing that we know as an anchor, as a rock in this changing world, Lord, your word never changes and you never change. Amen. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us afresh and anew, Lord, to realize what, it must, uh, what we must do to be saved, to be born again. May it be crystal clear this morning for those who have never done this yet, Lord, help them to believe upon Jesus today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated if you will. Thank you so much. Well, we've been doing this little series in John chapter 3, Salvation Truths in John chapter 3. And our first salvation truth was, unfortunately, we learned that not everyone can enter. Not everyone's going to go to heaven. Jesus said, except the man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And this is uh, taught throughout the scriptures. And Jesus himself said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in there at. And our plea to you this morning is do not be one of the many. We are of the few. Uh, if you have believed upon Christ, you are in the minority. Uh, but that's uh, Jesus' promise that, or he told us that uh, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life eternal. Few there be that find it. Please be one of the few. Please be one of those who enter into the straight gate, the narrow gate. And so the first truth is very unsettling, but it is true nonetheless that not everyone's going, not, a, not everyone can enter into the kingdom of God. The second truth we looked at last time was how to be born again. We, we know that we must be born again, but how does that happen? And we talked about <clears throat> the new birth being a new life. And just as you have physical life through birth, we get spiritual life through the new birth. And there is a life that satisfies that an unsafe person really doesn't know anything about. Uh, but certainly they know that there's something missing. And so there is a new life. And that new life comes from God. It doesn't come from the church. It doesn't come from religion. It doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from your family. It doesn't come from your parents. It comes from God. We are born of God. And how does that take place? Well, again, look back just one page to John chapter 1 and verse number 11. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. He came to Israel, he came to the Jewish people, and they rejected him. They received him not. And there's many like that today, that Jesus is presented to really all the world, and that they receive him not. <clears throat> Verse 12, but as many. Isn't that wonderful? Because uh, he doesn't make that it's, uh, this exclusive. He doesn't say, well, only some can be saved, but as many as would, whosoever will may come, but as many as received him. To them give he power to become the sons of God. And so if we receive him, instead of rejecting him, instead of receiving him not, if we receive him, then God gives us the authority to become the sons of God. We're born into God's family. And I want you to notice the last part of verse number 12. Even to them that believe on his name. So people who are born again are those who receive Christ. And that's a choice. That's what we looked at last time. That salvation or being born again is simply a choice that we make. We either receive or reject Christ. And that's a decision that we make. But the last part is what we're going to talk about today. Even to them that believe on his name. There's nothing more simple than that. Because there's no works involved. There's no rituals involved. It is simply a matter of the heart. 
And so this morning we're going to kind of elaborate a little bit more on that from verse 14 and verse 15. And we're, you know, we're simply asking the question, really, what does God want from you? What does God want from me? What is God looking for? Is God looking for a life? Is that what he's looking for? In order for him to receive us and get us into heaven, is he looking for a life? Is he looking for goodness on our part? Is that what he's looking for, that we must merit eternal life and merit heaven? And what we find from these verses is that that's not what God is looking for. God is not looking for a life. You know what he's looking for? This is really weird. But God is looking for a look. And I want to preach this morning on the look that saves. Salvation is in a look. Now, this is probably the most well-known chapter, really, in the Bible, John chapter 3. And really, it's a discussion between two people. Uh, Nicodemus, a, a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, very religious man, a ruler of Israel, which means he's part of the 70 top men, religious men, called the Sanhedrin. These are the judges of Israel, the very religious of the religious. And he came to Jesus, verse number 2, by night. Now, this happens around the Passover which is in the spring of the year. It's in Jerusalem. Jesus is there for the Passover. Nicodemus hears of Jesus and uh, of the things that he has done, the miracles that he's done, the teaching that he has. And he comes and he says to Jesus, we know that thou art come from God. No, no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And then Jesus says to him, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is approached by Nicodemus at night because Nicodemus was afraid of association with Jesus. You know, I certainly was afraid to be associated as a Christian. That was one of the things that put me off. All my friends were not Christians. And I just imagine that it got on their face when I told them that I would be a Christian. And of course that actually happened. But uh, he was afraid also uh, to be identified with Jesus. And some people are the same way today. Maybe you're that way. It's okay, it's one thing to come to church, but it's another thing to stand up and say, well, yes, I'm a believer in Christ. And yet Nicodemus uh, did believe that Jesus was from God, and eventually Nicodemus actually did become saved. In fact, he with Nick, uh, Joseph of Arimathea were the two men that, bought, uh, that buried, that embalmed Jesus and buried him after the crucifixion and put him in Joseph's tomb. Nicodemus was one of those men. And so G uh, Nicodemus did get saved, and we thank God for that. But Jesus told Nicodemus he needed to be born again. So life from the Spirit of God is salvation. And just as physical birth only happens once, so the new birth, spiritual birth, only happens once. Aren't you glad about that? You don't have to be born again and again and again, you know. We sing the song, you must be born again, but it's not you must be born again and again and again and again. <clears throat> once you get saved, you understand this? Once you get saved, you're saved forever. You know, I was saved, what is it, uh, 42 years ago, and I've never worried about dying ever since that. I've never worried about being saved after that, because once you get saved, you're saved, and you're saved forever. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if you didn't know you were saved, you're in and out, and you're, you get, you're lost one week and saved the next week, and you don't know if you're in and out, or up or down, or, I mean, what kind of life is that? And some people, that's the way they live, but that's not biblical. When you're born physically, you have life. You can't be unborn. Um... You know, I'm, I'm the son of Tommy and Jean Fittis, and no matter what happened in my life, uh, whether it was good or bad, I was always their son. That could never be reversed. That's on my birth certificate. When you get saved, God is your father. It cannot be reversed. It's a one-way door. You can't be unborn when you're born spiritually. You have life eternal, and that can never change. It's a wonderful thing to get saved. Yeah. And if you're struggling with it today, you know, once you get saved, once you make that decision, you never have to struggle about it anymore. <laughs> And you'll have peace and you'll have joy and you'll have assurance. In verse number eight, he says, it's an unseen thing. It certainly is something mysterious. You know, it's not a matter of just coming into church doing some hocus pocus, abracadabra, and all of a sudden, well, that's it. You just go through some sort of formula and you get it. That's not the way it works. In verse eight, Jesus said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. No, the wind comes from who knows where. But the wind goes wherever it wants to go. If it comes from the west or from the south, that's, that's, that's what happens. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. Where does the wind come from? Can you see the wind? You can't see the wind. You can see the trees being moved by the wind. You can see the dust being picked up by the wind, but you can't see the wind. Can you see the Spirit of God? 
Can you see the Spirit of God moving upon a person's heart? We talked about this last time, that Jesus is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. One thing we know about every person is that God is interested in, loves every person, is working in every heart. But can you see that? I can't see that. God sees the heart. Man sees the outward appearance. And so it's a, a, in a sense, it's, it's unseen, the, the work of the Spirit of God. Thy hears the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. It's something that's hidden. It happens in a man's heart. The workings of God with a man in his heart is something that is unseen. And in some ways it's mysterious in the sense that it's not just come to one, two, three, four, and that's, that's you see it. No, there's, there's something that happens in your relationship to God that's, that's unseen. And Jesus was explaining this to Nicodemus. So being born again is absolutely essential. It is the only way to heaven, Jesus said. But again, the question is, how, how does a man get born again? How does a person get seen? And of course, we've talked about this last time, but there's many, many false answers to that question. There's self-effort and there's religion and there's connection and all of that. And none of that seems... But there's only one right answer. And in John chapter 3, in fact, in the whole gospel of John, that answer is hammered into us over and over and over again. Now, let me show you how important this is. The four gospels, the first three, Matthew, Mark, Luke, are what we call synoptic gospels. Synoptic means, optic means to see. Sin means to gather. So it means uh, like sync, sync optic, synoptic. So the synoptic gospels are seeing the life of Christ from a particular viewpoint. The Gospel of John is different. And the first three Gospels were written long, long before the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John was one of the last books in the New Testament to be written by the Apostle John. The last book was written was the book of the Revelation just before John died when he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. Now what that means is that the Gospel of John was written about 85 AD. Now that's long after the book of Acts was written, long after many of the epistles in the New Testament were written. And so what I'm saying is this, it's almost like this is the last word that God is giving to us in the New Testament, especially concerning the plan of salvation, how to be seen. Because some people think, well, salvation, there's many things you've got to do, and there's, there's lists of things that you've got to do. And of course, church has a lot to do with that, and baptism is essential for some people to be saved. And yet you don't find it in the Gospel of John. There's one thing that is taught in the Gospel of John that is essential for salvation, and it's one word, and that word is believe. Believe. And this chapter emphasizes that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But as many as received him to them, he give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that, even to them that believe on his name. Now his name, Jesus, means Jehovah saves, the Lord saves. Salvation of, is of the Lord. But when we speak about the name of Jesus, we're speaking about who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Um, when you think of someone's name, we think of Herschel King. We, we know Herschel. We think of Herschel. We think of Herschel's person. We think of the things that Herschel has done. You think Tom Fittis. You're thinking about me and who I am and what I've done. You're thinking about the person and work of Jesus when you're thinking about his name. And when we believe in his name, what we're, we're believing what God says about Jesus. Who is he? He's not just man. He's the son of God. He's the son of man and the son of God and God the son. He's eternal without beginning and without end. He is all-powerful. He's omniscient, knows all things. He's uh, omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. That's an interesting thing. Look at verse 13. He says, No man hath sent it up to the Father, but he that came down from, the, from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. He's talking to Nicodemus. He's standing in Jerusalem. He says, Nobody came down from heaven except me, uh, who is in heaven. The Son of Man. Who, now, he's in Jerusalem, but he says, I'm also in heaven right now. You know, Jesus physically is in heaven, but he's also here. He's omnipresent. Only God has those attributes. And so his name speaks about who he is, but it also speaks about what he did. And in these verses, he's going to allude to that. And so Jesus reminds Nicodemus in verse 14 and 15 of an Old Testament story which illustrates and pictures Jesus in his person and in his work and what it is that God is looking for out of us. 
So let's look at verse 14 and 15 again. He says, as Moses lifted up. Now, did Nicodemus know about Moses? Of course he did. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah, uh, the Pentateuch was written, the books of Moses. And Nicodemus probably had the whole thing memorized. He knew Moses. Uh, uh, Israel, Judaism is based upon the law of Moses. And so he knew Moses and knew all the stories about Moses. And so Jesus tells him this story or reminds him of the story. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now this is at the beginning of the three years of Jesus' ministry. The cross had not happened yet. And the disciples and nobody even except Jesus knew what was going to happen. He alluded to it in chapter 2 verse 19. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But toward the end of Jesus' ministry is when he revealed he's going to Jerusalem to suffer uh, many things of, of men. And there he would, he, would be, he would die, he would suffer, and he would bleed and, bleed and die. When he told Peter that he was going to go to the cross, Peter didn't understand it. He says, what do you mean you're going to the cross? Be it far from you, Lord. You're not going to the cross. And Jesus had to rebuke Peter. Peter had no idea of the cross. And so God is revealing it. But right here, right at the very beginning, he's helping to understand that he would be lifted up between heaven and earth. He's going to be lifted up on a cross or on a pole, on a wooden pole, on the wooden cross. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, we've got to go back and find out the story for ourselves. So let's go back to Numbers chapter 21. Keep your place there in John 3, if you would, and go back to the book of Numbers. This is Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Or do not run from me, as the little boy in Sunday school said. So Numbers chapter 21 and verse number 4 through 9. We're going to read the story. It's really important because we got to understand what Nicodemus understood so that we would understand what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. So in Numbers 21, the children of Israel are in the exodus in the wilderness wanderings. Verse 4, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people speak against God and against Moses. You know when people get discouraged, they complain. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever found yourself complaining? We all do it. The problem was they were complaining against God and against God, God's leader, Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of the land of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loathes this light bread. What light bread was that? That was the manna, remember? God put a frost on the ground every morning and it was a frost of sweet bread. It was round, it was white, it was sweet. Uh, Leslie thinks that's Krispy Kreme donuts, you know. <laughs> she says, that's angel food. We're going to have Krispy Kreme donuts when we get to heaven. But they, they get sick of it. You know, you get the same thing over and over again. You get sick of it, even if it's a good thing. Our soul loathes this light bread. So verse 6, and the Lord sent. In other words, they're complaining. And they're sinning against God. Now what happens when we sin? What does God do? He brings judgment. So judgment comes in verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents. Now fiery, that could, that could mean a lot of things. It could be that they were like red like fiery red in their color. Uh, but I think primarily it, it means that they were poisonous. You get bit one of these things, you knew all about it. These were poisonous snakes, not one or two, but many of them uh, going through the camp and they were biting people. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. They were dying because of these snake bites. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. They knew they'd sinned. What was their sin? They spoke against God and they spoke against God's uh, leader, Moses. That's what the Bible calls blasphemy, when we blaspheme. Do you know we talk ill about people, we talk down about people, that's actually the sin of blasphemy. We talk uh, bad about God, that's blasphemy. We talk bad about people, that's blasphemy. And so they were guilty of blasphemy and this judgment was here. So they go to Moses and they cry to Moses. They always go to Moses to, to ask Moses to intercede. And so Moses, look at the last part of verse 7. <coughs> They said, pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Moses was good about doing that. They were talking about him, but he forgave them and he prayed for them. Now, here's the interesting thing. God, God sends the serpent, the, the, the snakes, and, and people are dying. And they cry to Moses. And Moses prays for them. He cries unto the Lord. And the prayer is, uh, get the Lord to take these snakes away. Okay. But how does the Lord do that? The Lord doesn't come and say, okay, snakes be gone, and they're just, they just vanish. 
And what we find here in this picture is something that's really important, that when God solves our problem, it's not that he just solves the problem. Many times he adds something to the problem. In other words, he adds something uh, that requires a response from us. So what does he do? Okay. So in verse 8, the Lord says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serp serpent had bitten any man, uh, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now this is really strange. It's weird. This is like Moses thinking, what in the world is... I mean, why doesn't God just get rid of the snakes? He doesn't do that. He says something really strange. He says, Moses, I want you to make a brass snake. Just like... The snakes that are in the camp. These fiery serpents, I want you to make one identical to that, make it molten out of brass. You see, the thing about it is, the snake is really judgment. The fiery serpent is judgment. And the thing that becomes the savior from the judgment is the same thing. This brass snake that is held up between heaven and earth upon a pole that actually becomes their salvation and their savior is the same thing that is their judge. Did you know that Jesus is our savior, but Jesus is also our judge? The judge is the savior. The savior is the judge. The snake is the judge and the snake is the savior. So, Moses makes this brass snake, and then he thinks to himself, okay, now, I've got to put it on a pole. It says a pole. Well, what's a pole going to be made out of plastic? Well, there was no something. Metal? No. Um, well, it's going to be a wooden pole. So whatever the snake's going to be hanging on is going to be made out of wood. So then you have another problem. How do you attach a, a brass snake to a wooden pole? I don't think they had duct tape in it. If it was, you know, I would be duct tape in it, but they probably didn't have duct tape. Uh, maybe they could have nailed it, which would have been interesting as well. But, you know, and we've said this before, but usually when you see people carrying snakes, they, you know, they don't handle them on their arms. They usually take the snake, right, and they, they put it around their neck. Now, I'm not in for that. I just don't do snakes. I shoot snakes. I don't handle snakes. Amen. So you got the snake, and you got it around your neck, okay? So how do you hang a snake on a pole? Because if you hung it on the pole, it would just slide down the pole, right? But say you took another piece of wood, say you got this pole that's a, made out of it's a wooden pole, it's probably a tree trunk of some sort, and you just take the end of that and you cut it off, and then you take that part and you nail it to the other piece, and then you have a little crossbar that goes across, and then you take this, the, this molded this snake and you hang it over the pole, and it comes down on this crossbar and it doesn't slide down. I think Justin would have probably figured that one out, wouldn't you? <laughs> it would have been a bit rustic, but it would have happened. Um, we, we probably figured that one out. Maybe, we don't know if that's what happened, but wouldn't that be interesting that in the Old Testament, in the wilderness, that there's a cross that is put up and there's a snake on that cross. The one that is the judge is also now the savior. As Moses lifted up the serpent, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. Jesus is lifted up on a wooden pole between heaven and earth. Nailed to that pole, we call it the cross. The Bible calls it the cross. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. See, Jesus, God doesn't come along and say to humanity because of our sin, well, you know, you're all forgiven. It doesn't happen that. He adds something to us that we have to respond to. In Noah's day, there was judgment becoming because of sin. And God just didn't end the judgment, even for Noah, the, the judgment still came. But what happened? He added something called the ark, something we had to respond to, get in the ark or stay out, receive the ark or reject the ark. But there's something we had to respond to. God adds something we have to respond to. And the cross was added by God that we have to respond to when it comes to our salvation. And so in verse 8 and 9, Moses makes this fiery serpent. He hangs it upon a pole. And he says that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass, put it a pole. It came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now this is amazing. The word goes out throughout the camp. Moses says, God has told me to do this. We're making this brass snake. We'll put it on the pole. Now everybody inside their tent, and they're snake bitten. They've got temperatures. They're, they're, they're terrible. They're, they're sick. They're going to die. 
and they hear the, the, the message being hurled it forth. Look at the snake. There's a snake that's lifted up upon a pole. You just have to look at it and you'll be healed. And some boy looks, he opens a tent door and he sees a snake off in the distance and he looks and he looks in faith and all of a sudden his sickness disappears and he's completely healed. He can't believe it. It's wonderful. But he knows his neighbor's in his tent. And so he goes to his neighbor's tent and he says, hey, Bob, come on. He says, there's a snake out here. We're told we just have to look at it and we'll be healed. And that's what I did and I'm healed. And Bob says, no, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. Have you ever heard of such a thing? No, I'm self-medicating. I think I've got the answer here. I'm going to put this medication on. I think I'll be able to handle it. And no, you've got to look at the snake. No, no, that's a lot of nonsense. That's superstition. Sure, he would do such a thing. And the man fails to look. And he dies. And so now in the New Testament, when the gospel goes forth, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And we believe on Christ and we find our sins forgiven and the joy that comes and the satisfaction and the peace yes. knowing that, our, that our, our transgressions are gone. They're removed from us as far as the east is from the west. We know that heaven is our home. God has saved us. We're born into his family. We have a relationship with God and he gives us joy and, and, uh, and the purpose in this life and then in the life to come, everlasting life. Wonderful what we have. And then we think of others. And we go to them and we say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. And they say, what's this lot of nonsense? Superstitious. No, no, I've got this to do and I've got to do. And I'm turning the new leaf and I've, I'm living a good life and I'm living a moral life. And I don't need any of that religious stuff. I don't need any of that Christ stuff. And they remain in their sin. It's exactly the same thing. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know what Jesus just did there? He equated believing on him with looking. Because in Moses' time, they didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to fix themselves. They didn't have to fix somebody else. All they were instructed to do was to look. And the moment they looked, they were, they were healed. And in the same way, Jesus said, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And people today say, well, that's, that's too simple. There's got to be more to salvation than simply looking. There's got to be more to salvation than simply believing in your heart. And say, well, there's, there, some people say, well, there's four steps, or there's seven steps to salvation. And, and uh, well, you must keep the commandments. You must keep the commandments, and you must... Uh, observe the sacraments, the, sac the seven sacraments of the church. You must observe the sacraments. You must certainly remain faithful. And you've got to join the right church. Oh, that's really important. You've got to be in the right church. And you certainly have to be baptized. And they've got all these things. They've got these lists of things to do. You don't find lists in here. There's one thing, one word, believe. The Philippian jailer said to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they simply said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved. Now, in, let me just show you this before we go. Look at John chapter 20 and verse 31. Because the point I'm making from the Gospel of John, this is the message. You know, in the Gospel of John, baptism or Baptist, and of course that would include John the Baptist and that, all that type of thing. The word baptism or baptize or baptist is only used in the Gospel of John 13 times. And the last time it's used in John chapter 4, verse number 2, where it says that Jesus didn't baptize anybody. Jesus is the Savior of the world, and he didn't baptize anybody. If baptism is part of salvation and Jesus didn't baptize anybody, that's kind of calls into question. Also, Paul didn't baptize very many. He said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. But the thing is, in the Gospel of John, believe is used 101 times. So multiple, multiple times more is emphasized the fact of faith, of believing. And so in John chapter 20, look please at verse uh, number 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. You know, everything is, that Jesus did is not written in the Gospel of John or any of the other Gospels. There's lots of things that Jesus did are not recorded. But he says, but these are written, verse 31, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that's his name, that's who he is, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Where does, where does life come through? Believing in his name. That's who he is and what he did. 
In other words, we're saved. We have eternal life. We have life and life eternal by believing. Amen. Now, when we go back to John, to go uh, John chapter 4, and you can do this for yourself. Just read through the Gospel of John and mark where it says believe. Because in John chapter 4, Jesus had to go through Samaria because there's a Samaritan. Now, she's not even Jewish. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. But here's a woman. And by the way, she was an, a, 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 an, an immoral woman. She had been married five times, and the guy she's now with is not even her husband. And, uh, but Jesus knew she had a need, and she knew he would, she would be there at the well at midday, which the women never go to the well at midday. And the, are you joking? In the, in the heat of the sun, who would go to the well carrying water in the middle of the day? Are you mad? No, the women would get the water in the morning time when it was cool. Do you know what? This woman was not welcome with the other women. She was an outcast. She was rejected because of her lifestyle and for her sin. But Jesus knew she would be there. And so there he went and was at Jacob's well. And the woman was there. And he had this conversation with the woman. And he told her all about himself. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith that they give me to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. And she says, give me this water. She's thinking physical water. And she says, he says, go call your husband. Oh, God always deals with our sin. But he's the forgiver of sin. See, he's the snake in the sense that he's the judge of sin. But he's also the snake on the pole in that he's the savior. The same one who is the judge is also the savior. You see, Jesus is either your savior or your judge. God's got two hands, the hand of wrath and judgment or the hand of grace and mercy. And you get to decide which one you want. He's offering grace and mercy. If you reject and spurn that hand, if you reject him as your savior, then there's another hand that's coming. That's the hand of judgment. So you're going to face Jesus either way, either as your Savior or as your judge. And so the woman gets saved. And I want you to look down at chapter 4 and verse 39. Because after she gets saved, she goes back into the city and she tells the men. Of course, the men knew about her reputation. But she said, come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. And in verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans came, verse 40, when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days, and many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard of ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. But what is the emphasis? The emphasis is believe. Amen. They believed. And that's what saved them. Is there any record of this woman getting baptized? Is there any record of the people of, of the city of Sychar and Samaria getting baptized? No. Do you know why? Because they weren't. But they were saved. When you go to chapter 5 and verse 46 and verse 47, what's the emphasis? Jesus said, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. How did Moses write of Jesus? Moses wrote 1,500 years before Jesus was born. And yet he did. Remember? Genesis 22. Exodus chapter 12, and, and here in this story, in Numbers 21 and other places, verse 47, but ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? What's the emphasis? Believe. Do you know what takes you to heaven instead of hell? Believe. Believe. It's not the church. It's not the baptism. It's not your faithfulness. It's not you. It's him. And it's looking to him in faith. Look over chapter 6 and verse 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do? What shall we see? People always want to do something. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Look at chapter 9. Do you remember the man that was born blind? What a wonderful story that was. And the guy who went down to wash in the pool of Siloam and he came back up to the Temple of Mount seeing. And uh, he says, It's brilliant. He says, I can see. They couldn't believe it. He'd been born blind, and now he could see. And they took him into the synagogue and said, who, who, who did this to you? And he says, it was Jesus. And, um, and they, they, they threw him out of the synagogue. They were prejudiced against. And so when Jesus knew that the man had been thrown out, then Jesus went looking for him. And down in verse number 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? What is, what is, what is God looking for? What does, he look, what does he want out of you? Dost thou believe on the Son of God? I love this. Look at verse 36. And he answered, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Because he hadn't seen, you know, he had heard Jesus. Jesus touched his eyes with the clay, you remember. He had heard Jesus, but he hadn't actually seen Jesus. 
to this point. Now he's looking at Jesus. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Who is the Son of God? You've seen him. Well, that's really, you know, we've only seen a few people in the last, you know, couple of hours. And it's he that speaks with you. You know what Jesus said? When he said, who is the Son of God? Jesus says, you're looking at him. Did Jesus claim to be God? Did Jesus claim to be the Son of God? Did Jesus claim to be the Savior? Over and over he did. He says, you're looking at him. Dost thou believe? Look at verse 38. I love this. And he said, and I believe he just fell to his knees at this point. And he said, Lord, I believe. Lord, three words. Lord, I believe. Now he had been healed. His eyesight had been healed. But this is when he got saved. This is when he got eternal life. Because eternal life comes through Jesus. And he fell to Jesus' knees. And he simply said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And that's when he got saved. But what does the Bible, where does the Bible emphasize? What does he emphasize? Always, always belief. Always faith. What is it that God's looking for? He's looking for faith. A look of faith. Let me show you a couple of other things just before we go. Look at Psalm 22. Psalm 22 written by David, 1050 years B.C. And you see, some people will look to Calvary. They'll look to Jesus in cruelty. Some, most people are not interested in Jesus, but sometimes people, uh, they get kind of, um, they're interested in the, the gore, in the blood, in the pain and the suffering. Uh, in Psalm 22, you have this recorded for us. Now, this is the psalm. This is what Jesus quoted on the cross in verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look at verse 7. All they that see me, this is the words of Jesus. All they, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, see him he delighted him. Some people will look at Jesus and, in disgust, in cruelty. They will laugh. All they that see me, they're looking at Jesus. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. Now this is written 1,500 years before Jesus was born, and it's a vivid description of what Jesus experienced on the cross. They were looking at him in cruelty, and then they also looked at him in curiosity. Look at verse 16. For dogs have compassed me. Dogs was a common term that the Jews used for Gentiles. The Romans, who were Gentiles, surrounded Jesus. They compassed him. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Did you see that? They pierced my hands and my... David's writing this. David never had his hands and feet pierced. This is a prophecy of Jesus when they nailed him to the cross. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now watch. I may tell all my bones. The word tell means to count. Like the bank teller, a teller, a counter. I may tell all my bones. Now watch. They look and stir upon me. When Jesus hung upon the cross, you know, many, many people looked at him. He hung there in nakedness because in verse 18 it goes on to say, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Remember the Roman soldiers took his garments, they stripped them. And there was one garment that Jesus had from top to bottom without seam, a special expensive garment. And they didn't want the, uh, if some, one of the soldiers had said, I'll have that, the other three would have been on him. There was four soldiers, you see, the Roman quadrium. And so they gambled for it. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. That's an interesting prophecy, isn't it? How did David know that stuff? A thousand five hundred years before Jesus was born. But it says they look and stir upon me. They looked in curiosity. And there's a lot of people look at Christianity with curiosity, but that's all it is. You know, God doesn't want you to look in cruelty. He doesn't want you to look in curiosity. But there is a look he wants you to have. I want you to look at Zechariah. And we'll finish with this. Zechariah chapter 12. Find Matthew, go back two books, Zechariah chapter 12. This is at the Battle of Armageddon. This is still future. This is when Israel, uh, Judah, and Jerusalem are surrounded by the armies of the Antichrist, of a world army coming against Israel to completely annihilate them, just like Hitler tried to do. Uh, the Antichrist, Hitler is a type of Antichrist, but the Antichrist will actually come into the land of Israel to do this. And so in verse Nine, and it shall come to pass in that day, there is a day coming when this will happen, that I will seek to destroy, this is God speaking, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. 
Now, this is the battle of Armageddon. This is at the second coming of Jesus. This is when Israel lifts up their heads and they see Jesus coming on the white horse in power and glory, not on the donkey in humility. And so in verse 10 it says, And I, God says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. Now watch, God is speaking and he says, And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. There's coming a time when the Jewish people will lift up their heads, they will see Jesus coming, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. And it's interesting that God is talking here. When was God ever pierced? We'll see Jesus is gone. It's speaking about Jesus. And it's, it's, God is speaking, and yet he it talks about him. He's, he's talking about, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, Father, Son, you see. And so they, when Israel look upon Jesus, when he comes the second time, they will believe, they will receive him. And when they look upon him with conviction, they realized who the real Messiah was that they rejected for 2,000 years. That's why they mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. But they look with conviction. In Isaiah 45, verse 22, God says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Now, what does God want from you? Is he wanting from you a perfect life, a good life? Now, once you're saved, you should do your best to live right, right? But living right is not going to get you to heaven. Living right is the fruit of the knowledge that you know you're already on your way to heaven. Because going to heaven is grace. Going to heaven is the gift of God. Going to heaven is something God does for you. You say, well, how does that happen? Here's what God's looking for you. Jesus is hanging upon the cross. All your sin, your iniquities is upon him. Your shame, your judgment is upon him. And you have a need. All of us are sinners. All of us are under the condemnation of God. And Jesus has been sent. As it says in the next verse, in verse 17, for God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so Jesus is hanging upon the, hanging upon the cross and he's looking at you. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm doing all of this for you. I'm providing for you eternal salvation. Now, what is your response? See, God asks, he adds something that we have to respond to. And so Jesus is looking at you. Now, what he wants you to do is to look back. When you look, we're not talking about looking to the preacher or the church or your parents or your family or your uh, brothers or sisters or anybody else. He wants you to look at him in faith. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and all they had to do was look. But you see, it's a look of conviction. You're looking and you're saying, Lord, I need you. And what you did on the cross is the provision for my need. It's the payment for my fine. And Lord, I look to you in faith. And Lord, it's a look of have mercy. It's a look of, Lord, give grace. Lord, Please save me. It's a look of faith and dependence upon him. It's, he's looking at you. Will you look back? You know that's how Hagar gets saved. Do you remember? She called the name of the place Beer Le Hayroy, which is the well of the living one who sees me. And here's what she said. Have I now looked to him who saith me? Jesus, she says, God's been looking at me the whole time. And I, I haven't looked back. I haven't been looking to him who's been looking at me. And what God is wanting from you is he wants you to look back at him. He says, look, I've done all this for you because I love you and I want to save you. So, will you receive me? Will you receive my payment for your sin? Will you take my payment for your fine? Will you receive my payment on your behalf? Will you look to me? Will you believe upon me? That's what he's looking for. What God is looking for is not a life, but a look. Salvation's in a look. Look and live, just as Moses. And all you must do is understand your need. And get your, get your eyes off everything else. Get your eyes off the preacher. Get your eyes off the church. And look to Christ. Look to Christ. And the moment you do that in faith, in that moment, you will be healed. You'll be saved. You'll be born again. You'll be redeemed. You'll be justified. You'll be adopted. You'll be born again into the family of God. Let's pray together for prayer. Father, thank you for your word.
And Lord, we're grateful that you have spelled it out for us that salvation is not something we deserve or earn. It's something that you did for us. It's something that you earned for us. It's through your work on Calvary is our only hope for salvation. And the way that we make the connection is by understanding our need and lifting up our eyes and looking upon you. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God and there's none else. There is nobody else, Lord, that can, that can do it. You're the only one, Lord, that can provide what we need. Lord, I pray that every saved person here will remember that look of faith. Remember and appreciate, Lord, that it's not us, but it's you. And Lord, for those who are listening and those who are here today who are not saved, we pray that you'd help them, Lord, to get their eyes off themselves or other things or other people and to look to you. And Lord, help them to be saved. Salvation is so simple. It's just a look. Lord, help them to turn to you and believe upon you this morning. Lord, please, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.